and um, Opera for inviting me. It's really nice to be here. And thank you all for coming. I, um, it's really, really great to see such an audience on a Saturday morning. Um, so I'll be talking to you about um, a new technique that we developed and recently applied to different type of data sets in order to understand different brain states, including the psychedelics. So hopefully it's going to become clearer as we go along what I meant with um, singing the mind. So I'll be talking to you about uh, what we call the cornectome harmonic signatures, which really relates to music and what it reveals about different brain states or different states that a person can experience in, under the influence of psychedelics in meditation or also in sleep. So in neuroscience, we are, um, I mean, there is, a, there is a psychedelic renaissance that's happening right now, but also in parallel, it's very interesting to observe that there is another renaissance going on in neuroscience, uh, and many researchers are becoming more and more interested in neural correlates of consciousness. And it's quite interesting to observe that as well, because uh, almost like 20 years ago, consciousness was one of these very loaded words, and... Um, People didn't want to work on it as much, and it's very encouraging that nowadays there's a giant literature on that where people are looking at what is happening in the brain when you're in the conscious state or under the influence of different types of psychedelics or in meditation as well as sleep. So we can think of all of these as different states of consciousness. And what we did in this work is kind of slightly changing this question to what kind of music is your brain playing when you are in the awake conscious state or under the influence of psychedelics or in, in sleep or meditation. And before I go, I mean, I will come to psychedelics, I, I promise, but let me introduce you very briefly the idea of harmonics and then we move to connect on harmonics and what they mean. So I want to show you first a very brief illustration um, or visual illustration of the harmonic patterns and how they link to music very briefly. so if you want to check it later on. But what I want to point out here, uh, what it beautifully illustrates is these sand patterns uh, or these patterns uh, that emerge nowadays, which is what's called cymatics. But actually it's a very old experiment done by a musician uh, called Ernst Gladney in the 18th century, where he um, put some sand on the metal plate and, and he let the plate vibrate. And that actually enforces some kind of a, a standing wave on the metal plate. And what was really nice in that video is when he was playing a different musical note, a different pattern is emerging on the plate. So this is happening because every, every system, even a simple metal plate, has certain preferred frequencies called its natural frequencies. And if you excite it with one of these frequencies, it will resonate and form these complex patterns. Now, in the standing wave, certain parts of the plate are moving up, uh, like the green ones here, and the other ones are moving down, and then they swap over time, and of course the sand accumulates at the boundaries of these regions, forming these very complex sand patterns. And this is in fact how we also create music. So for each musical note that we play in a musical instrument, there is an accompanying standing wave pattern emerging within the instrument. And even though these sand patterns are seemingly quite complex and they are very different for different frequencies, they all can be estimated by solving one simple line of equation. So we're not going to go into the details of the equation, but uh, I just want to mention that it is, it's a, an eigen decomposition of, of an operator called Laplace operator. And what this equation actually tells us is that it gives us a harmonic pattern, a spatial pattern which describes the distribution of, of sand. 
And the temporal part, which is this part here, tells us the natural frequency that accompanies that, that spatial pattern. So in a way, it's, um, it gives us a decomposition of space, time, and geometry. So it's an equation which links all these three components. And quite remarkably, the same equation actually occurs uh, in describing various different types of natural phenomena. So it's, uh, it also describes electron orbits and atomic energy levels in quantum mechanics, electromagnetic interactions within a grid of ions, and very, very remarkably, it also provides us the building blocks of biological pattern formation and morphogenesis. So um, this was very, very encouraging for us to, to, to continue on this line of thought and apply it to the brain because uh, if you look at different animal code patterns in nature uh, and describe them mathematically, the equations that, that we can describe them with in the end of the day boil down to these, the combination of these harmonics. And um, Murray and his colleagues have actually shown this not only mathematically, but they did this great experiment where they cut the metal plates in shape of an animal's skin and then they captured the vibration modes, the standing waves that would emerge on them for different frequencies. And they observed that they actually really resemble different types of animal code patterns for different frequencies. So, in the end of the day, when we look at this uh, example phenomenon, where, um, in, the, in this case, let's stick to the music example and the vibration of the plates. So we have the dynamics which are coming from the vibrations. And then uh, the equation that we, we are looking at, the eigen decomposition of the Laplacian, actually gives us a, a link between space, time, and geometry of the metal plate. So the leap that we took, uh, in a way, came from, from this similarity between this example and the, the puzzle that we are trying to solve about the brain. So in this case, we also have uh, certain <coughs> dynamics which are coming from neurophysiology. And then uh, we have the space, time, and anatomy. So let me explain it a little. In terms of time, we know that neural activity oscillates over time, and these oscillations actually cover a very wide range of frequencies, ranging from 0.05 Hz all the way up to 500 Hz. And uh, in the last more or less two decades now, we are aware that these oscillations are structured, even if you are not doing any kind of task but resting in the scanner. So if we take a seed location here on the cortex and look at how correlated its activity is over time to all other locations on the cortex, we see these, these very complex but distributed patterns of correlation. So they innovate uh, in a way, oscillates synchronously. Uh oh. Just one second, sorry. <laughs> Again. So these, these correlation patterns that we observed uh, with the seed-based correlations, actually they form certain networks that today we know are the resting state networks, they are termed. And finally, we also have uh, today with the current technology, we have access to a very detailed mapping of human brain's anatomical connectivity. So we can trace the long distance fibers, it's not only the, the anatomy that uh, the structure of the cortex, but we also can trace these long distance fibers that you see in this video, which connect distant parts of the thalamocortical system. And uh, the set of all of these connections is termed uh, nowadays the human connector. So we wanted to test whether um, the same type of fundamental principle could also underlie brain activity, the same way that uh, the eigen decomposition of the Laplacian actually links together uh, space, time and geometry, whether it could also explain the, the temporal uh, oscillations and resting state networks that 
that we find in the brain, given that they are constrained by the anatomical connectivity of the human brain, by the human connectome. So in order to test that, uh, we have to solve the same equation on the human brain. So what we did was we took the uh, magnetic resonance imaging data and we reconstructed the, the gray matter cortical surface. And then we took the diffusion tensor imaging data where we can find these traces, these long distance fibers, which give us the long distance connectivity. And then we uh, combined these two different types of connectivities in order to create a detailed map of the human connectome. And then we applied the Laplace operator, the famous operator that I mentioned is actually uh, occurring in various different, in description of various different phenomena. We applied this operator this time to the connectivity of the human brain. And when we solved the same equation that they solved on metal plates or animal skins and so on, this time we found um, what we call the connectome harmonics. So the harmonic patterns are this time emerging on the cortex. And as you can see here, as expected, they're actually, uh, like on the metal plates, they, their complexity increases for increasing frequency. And for different frequencies, we get different type of patterns. So we can think of them as the correlation patterns because the, the colors indicate uh, more or less their, um, in a way, their amplitude in that oscillation analogy. So, this was all kind of expected when we first started this study, but what we um, didn't expect to see and what, what kind of encouraged us to go deeper in this study was that one of these harmonic patterns, uh, the ninth more or less in all different subjects, was very similar to one of the networks, uh, one of the resting state networks that's very well known as the default mode network. So we wanted to see if that was just a subject-specific situation for one subject that we were lucky or if it was actually consistent. And when we looked at different subjects, we found that there was always one uh, harmonic that significantly matched the default mode network. And if we analyzed, uh, like we quantitatively evaluated it, that was always there uh, using different types of uh, similarity measures as well. So then the next question was whether it was only the default mode network or if other networks were also present in this harmonic spectrum. And when we looked at different types of resting state networks that were reported in the literature, we saw that they actually significantly matched a different part of the connectome harmonic spectrum. So that um, kind of tells us that it may very well be the case that this type of uh, fundamental principle, this uh, harmonic principle, the eigen decomposition of the Laplace operator, really may be a good approximation to describe uh, what is going on in the brain over time. So, in a way that um, suggests that that may be a link uh, between the temporal oscillations, the spatial networks and the, and the anatomy of the human brain, but then, if that's really the case, then we should, there should be a biological um, mechanism creating these waves in the, in the human brain. So, in neural activity, we know that uh, what gives rise to these temporal oscillations as well as spatial patterns is neurophysiology. So, it's the interaction between excitatory and inhibitory um, neural populations. And maybe it's easier to... Uh, to see it on, on a picture like this, it, uh, that actually the interaction between excitation and inhibition can naturally give rise to a pattern formation. So the patterns would self-organize. And how that is happening is, um, so here we have, let's imagine we have two different types of populations. We have the little fish and the big, and the sharks. So the, Imagine the little fish is the excitatory population because little fish want to be near little fish. So wherever there is a little fish, there are going to be other ones there. So it's kind of similar to excitatory activity. Whereas the sharks are inhibitory because little fish don't want to go near the sharks. And by describing, uh, by the interaction of these two types of populations, these patterns naturally form um, in, in terms of fish concentration. And the same thing is actually happening in the brain as well. So if uh, by the interaction between excitatory and inhibitory neural populations, the patterns naturally self-organize in the brain. And if you link it to consciousness, 
we know that um, it could be due to anesthetics or due to sleep, but it doesn't matter. In all of these cases, there seem to be the general trend that when we lose consciousness, there is generally an increase in inhibition and or a decrease in excitation. So we wanted to see whether a computational model um, similar to the ones that people have used to describe the animal code patterns could actually also um, give us kind of insights about neural activity in the brain. And this is the part that we're actually also now working uh, with Marco on extending further. So what we found, what we did was we described uh, the dynamics of excitatory and inhibitory neural activity on the human connectome, again using the Laplace operator. And what we found was um, when we actually, not only the patterns formed very naturally, not only they self-organized in an oscillatory manner, but when we decrease excitation and increase inhibition, the oscillations actually slow down. And this is also what is happening when we fall into deep sleep, for instance. And the patterns also changed. So when we look at what is happening in the brain or in the computational model, we are not yet uh, really talking about neural data, um, in terms of these connectome harmonics is that they're actually, when we make the model uh, lose consciousness, it actually narrows down the repertoire of, of connectome harmonics. Um, and that is also reported in the literature in terms of these functional connectivity patterns, the correlation patterns, this is what people have found uh, in loss of consciousness. So with the computational model that kind of uh, the link between the connectome harmonics and description of the dynamics and all these other pieces of the, uh, of the puzzle kind of fitting together encouraged us to go even further and uh, look at what we call harmonic signatures uh, but connectome harmonic signatures in actually fMRI data. Uh, and so I want to very, very quickly um, explain what the harmonic signatures mean before coming to connectome harmonics. So one interesting thing about these, um, these harmonic patterns is that if you, instead of solving it on a metal plate or the brain, if you solve it on, on a ring, actually, they would give us what is very well known as, as the sine and cosine functions, which are the basis of the, which are the Fourier basis, the basis of the Fourier transform. So you can represent any um, one-dimensional signal as a, as a superposition or as a combination of these uh, sines and cosines. And people have extended the same idea to spherical harmonics or other types of manifold harmonics. And what we did is just extending the same idea to, to the human brain. And here, this is just to illustrate that how it is actually happening when you add more and more components, more and more of these waves, the reconstruction of your original signal is becoming, in a way, sharper and sharper. I don't know if you can already guess what the, the picture is. Emerging, but yeah, I think it's very obvious now. So, and they do actually have a um, people played with these ideas with the with the reconstruction using different frequencies and so on. For instance, let's see, who do you see here? Oh. <laughs> so it, this picture was created by combining the low frequencies from Marilyn Monroe and high frequencies from Albert Einstein and depending on what scale you're looking at you would observe a different person. So it's in a way, it is an equivalent in human perception as well, but I just wanted to uh, point out that any signal can be reconstructed from the combination of these waves. Now. Um, what we did was to look at the, to, to decompose fMRI brain activity in the psychedelic state, in sleep and in meditation uh, into these harmonic brain states. And the way we did that is we took uh, the fMRI data at each time point, so time one, so this is over time, and we estimate the contribution of each of these harmonic patterns. And then based on that contribution, we can estimate how, like, how powerful they're expressed, so that would give us the power and how much energy they carry in their expression, so it's in a way frequency-weighted version of that. So, 
Coming back to the very beginning of the talk, knowing that these patterns are actually um, also emerging in musical instruments when we play a musical note, when we do this kind of decomposition, what we're asking is what kind of music is your brain playing in the resting state and what it would play uh, in the psychedelic state induced by LSD, for instance. So in order to, to answer that question or investigate it, we looked at the fMRI data uh, of 12 healthy participants under the influence of LSD or psilocybin. And the scanning happened in uh, three different, like three scanning sessions consecutively. And in the first and the third session, the subjects were simply resting in the scanner. But in the second session, they were also listening to music. So when we look at the data um, and the, the connectome harmonic decomposition, so here we see the total power and the total energy of all harmonics all together without distinguishing any different frequencies. And uh, the darker colors are placebo and the psychedelic colors are, uh, represent LSD um, scans. And what we observed was in all of these three different scans, there was always a significant increase in the total energy and the total power um, under the influence of LSD. And when we looked at the probability of reaching a certain energy state, it actually significantly shifted towards high energy states under, under LSD compared to placebo. So next we wanted to see whether um, different frequencies had different types of contributions for, for this type of energy increase or power increase. And when we look at the differences uh, between LSD and placebo in all these three scans, what we find is there is actually a suppression in a narrow range of low frequency connectome harmonics and a, um, an increase of energy in a very broad range of high frequencies. So this is um, represented in the logarithmic scale, so this would correspond to more or less 100 or 200 connectome harmonics, whereas we have in total 20,000. So it's a very broad range of high frequency connectome harmonics actually increase their activity, increase their contribution under the influence of LSD. So the question next is that whether this type of energy changes actually have any meaning for the subjective experience that people were experiencing during their trip. When we looked at uh, the amount of suppression in, in the first 200 low frequencies, we found that actually it's significantly correlated with the intensity of ego dissolution that the subjects themselves have reported. So that was um, stated as uh, feeling no boundaries or feeling one with the universe. And very interestingly, the same, uh, the activity of the same set of connectome harmonics um, also significantly correlated with the emotional arousal. So the, the suppression of low frequencies also meant the, the bigger the suppression, uh, the, the more intense the emotional arousal was. But it wasn't enough to explain um, the intensity of the positive mood. So the positive mood actually correlated with the energy changes of a broader range of frequencies, a broader range of um, connectome harmonics, which contain this low frequency suppression, but also the increase of a higher frequency range. Okay, so um, now based on that kind of uh, spectrum analysis, we wanted to see whether the repertoire meant anything. Because if you remember the, the computational model, when we made the computational model lose consciousness, it actually narrowed down the, the repertoire of connectome harmonics. Now we are looking at the actual data with fMRI uh, and in the, in, uh, under the influence of LSD, whether the repertoire of connectome harmonics actually changed under, uh, in the psychedelic state. So, here we looked at the, the probability of observing uh, a certain amount of contribution without distinguishing whether it's low frequency or high frequency. So in terms of uh, the musical analogy, what this plot tells us is the zero here gives us more or less the, the probability or the number of harmonics that are silent at any given time during the scan. 
and the tails tell us how, uh, what is the probability of any of these harmonics contributing really loudly. And what we find in the LSD state is that the number of silent connectome harmonics actually decreases. So that means more of these harmonics uh, are contributing to brain activity simultaneously. So in a way, we observe an expansion of the repertoire of connectome harmonics, which really is the opposite of what the model does when, we, when the model loses consciousness. And that was um, quite interesting to, to see, because when we looked in the literature, um, in terms of music and uh, music improvisation, we nicely came across this study which reports that actually improvising jazz musicians play significantly more musical notes during improvisation compared to memorized play. So coming back to the analogy of the music and what your brain does, so your brain is also using many more of these connectome harmonics which are similar to musical notes of, of the brain in a way, uh, under, the LS, under the influence of LSD. So there seems to be quite a parallel um, between this type of using more musical notes in, the, um, in improvisation and more harmonics in the LSD state. But of course, um, it could be quite random. So like a, like a child uh, pressing the, no, the keys of a piano just randomly. And when we look at um, the correlation patterns across different frequencies, we actually found that they were, um, there were quite significant uh, cross-frequency correlations under the influence of LSD. So that, that actually implies that there's a certain structure. It's not, your brain is really not randomly activating certain, certain musical notes like a, like a child pressing the keys of a piano, but there is a different type of structure, uh, structural organization in, in the brain's dynamics. So it indicates uh, or suggests that LSD actually expands the repertoire of connectome harmonics while maintaining a complex and spontaneous order, which quite nicely um, parallels uh, like jazz improvisation, improvising jazz musician in terms of musical notes. And there is one particular um, case, one particular scenario uh, where complex systems and dynamical systems actually show this kind, of, this kind of repertoire expansion. And that is when they approach what is called criticality. So criticality is actually this type of special type of dynamics that emerge just at the boundary, at the transition between order and chaos. When these two types of very opposite types of dynamics are actually in balance. And to give you a bit of an intuition about criticality, it's actually said to be the constantly shifting battle zone between stagnation and anarchy. The one place that, uh, where a complex system can be spontaneous, adaptive and alive. And it is where life has enough stability to sustain itself and enough creativity to deserve the name of life. And if you Think of this interpretation in terms of the brain, it also kind of makes sense. So um, at criticality, you would have enough stability to function in a meaningful way, yet enough freedom to create something totally new, something totally different than what has been before. And criti critical systems do have kind of a fingerprint that you would always observe if you're observing a critical system. So that is uh, the, the fingerprint that they show is the emergence of power laws. So if you were to plot two different uh, variables in your system in relationship to each other, they would always follow power laws, meaning that they would, in logarithmic coordinates, they would follow this line. And when we look at the fMRI data, we do find these type of power law distributions in the um, power versus frequency your wave number, it's indicated by number, wave number here, power versus frequency relationships. And what is quite uh, interesting here is that we find these type of power law distributions for both actually, for placebo as well as LSD. So what does that mean? That means actually even in the resting state, our brains are close enough 
to criticality, to this delicate balance between, uh, between order and chaos, that we can observe its fingerprints, its signatures. But when we look a little more closely, we find uh, that there are differences in these signatures. Okay, sorry. So here, um, so first of all, the, the slope of this curve is changing under the influence of LSD, which is indicated in these bars here. Its, uh, its slope is decreasing under the effect of LSD, so that means there are changes in these critical signatures occurring in the brain. And also, when we, when we um, fit this line to the data points, we observe that it was actually fitting more closely in the, under the influence of LSD compared to placebo. So that, that suggests that um, in the LSD state, brain dynamics uh, show kind of more enhanced signatures of criticality, where power laws become more accurate and uh, more, more enhanced. And it, uh, in the, it suggests that LSD actually shifts the brain activity further towards criticality. So it's kind of tunes your brain in a way more towards criticality. So to summarize what we found um, in terms of connectome harmonic signatures of LSD, so first of all, we observed an increase in the total energy and the total power of brain activity. So your brain actually operates with a higher energy and higher power under the effect of LSD. And the probability of reaching a high energy state is, is actually much higher under the influence of LSD compared to placebo. Um, and we found that actually it acts in a frequency selective manner. So low frequencies are kind of suppressed uh, by LSD, but a broad range of high frequency connectome harmonics actually become way more active. And we observed uh, enhanced signatures of criticality suggesting that your brain is actually maybe tuning towards criticality under the effect of psychedelics or LSD. So we wanted to know whether that was, because that was the first time we applied the connectome harmonic decomposition and we, we were lucky enough to start with an exciting data set such as the, the LSD data set. And we wanted to know whether it was only due to LSD or other psychedelics uh, also had similar connectome harmonic signatures in the brain. So we, we looked at um, a psilocybin data set, which psilocybin is the psychedelic compound found in magic mushrooms. And uh, so we looked at 12 healthy participants' uh, data in psilocybin and placebo. And quite nicely, we found the same type of effect uh, as we observed in LSD. So here we found an increase, a significant increase in the total power and the total energy. And again, a shift um, of the probability, the peak of the probability distribution of observing a, an energy state towards high energies. And very nicely, we found also a similar type of suppression in the low frequency range uh, and an increase uh, of activity in a broad range of high frequencies. Again, paralleling what we found in the, under the effect of LSD. And when we looked at the, the signatures of criticality, we again observed a similar uh, change under the effect of psilocybin. So here again, we found that the slope of this, uh, the power law was changing, indicating there's a change uh, in, in terms of critical signatures. And also the signatures were actually more enhanced under the effect of psilocybin. So, it may really be the case that also under the effect of psilocybin, the brain dynamics are delicately balancing at this um, edge, of, edge of chaos, in a way. So, um, before actually coming to the closing, I would like to show you two different brain states as well, just uh, as a comparison. So we also looked at the meditation as well as sleep state using the very same analysis. And in uh, meditation uh, experiments, we had 16 um, healthy subjects which uh, never meditated before, and 16 very experienced meditators. Um, and in the experiments, there were two different conditions. So they were either resting in the scanner or uh, they were meditating in the scanner. And it was mindfulness meditation. 
So here uh, we see with the lighter colors, the experienced meditators and darker colors, the controls. And what we found was for experienced meditators um, during meditation, which is indicated by blue, the total energy and the total power significantly increased. So this is what we have observed in the psychedelic state as well. And if you look at the probability of, sub of observing a certain energy state, again, for the experienced meditators, we see a clear shift towards high energy values in terms of the peak of the probability, So, which is this light blue curve here. And if you look at the dark blue, which is the controls during meditation, we see this kind of a um, little bump in the same frequent energy range but they don't manage to shift their dominant, um, dominant energy state to, to these high energies in a way, but they, they seem to be really trying. Um, and when we look at the difference between resting state and meditation, here again we found um, quite remarkably the same type of increase in high frequency, uh, in the energy of high frequency connect on harmonics. Uh, that we also have observed for LSD or psilocybin. So if you look at this range, which also showed such an increase, and the increase is much, much more in experienced meditators compared to, to the controls. Although we didn't uh, observe the, the suppression that we found in the psychedelic state. So there seemed to be quite an overlap in, in terms of high frequencies, but there are some differences uh, happening as well in the in the low frequency range. And when we looked at the signatures of criticality um, in in this data set, we again found differences in the slope of the curve. So the, the critical signatures changed. And for experienced meditators, um, we did find actually a better fit in the resting condition for experienced meditators. So there is a possibility that this is uh, this is due to the long-term effect of meditation on the brain, but there is also a chance that this is happening due to the um, large differences in their experience in, in the hours of meditation experience, and this is happening due to the in individual differences. So we, will, we are uh, looking more in detail into, the re into these results before actually getting any excited about it. But the overall picture actually suggests that there is a remarkable similarity in terms of connectome harmonic signatures of the brain activity of experienced meditators and the psychedelic state. So it, it may very well be the case that one um, may be able to trip on their own resources if you're experienced enough in meditation. And finally, uh, we also looked at the, at the sleep state where um, we looked at the fMRI data of uh, 18 healthy participants in the wakeful resting state, which uh, will be shown in red in the next slide, and the early sleep stage, uh, non-REM stage 1, non-REM stage 2, and deep sleep. So here, um, very interestingly, in the early sleep stages, we found an increase in the total uh, power and the total energy of the brain state. So that's kind of following what we have found for the, for the meditation as well as for the psychedelic state. But what is quite interesting in, in all these plots as well as uh, in the probability distribution is that the dark blue, which is the deep sleep, is actually following the exact opposite type of signatures as the psychedelic state or the meditation. So we find a decrease uh, of the energy and the power of the brain um, and the peak here is actually occurring at a very low energy state. So in a way it's showing the opposite characteristics. And we, when we look at um, the difference between resting state, between conscious resting state, and these three sleep stages, again here we find um, the opposite effect in deep sleep. So if you recall what we have observed for the psychedelic state, it was suppressing the low frequencies but increasing high frequencies, which uh, seem to be inverted for deep sleep. So if we think of, in a way, psychedelic state as an enhanced uh, state of consciousness or in, like increased awareness or a, increased uh, repertoire of experiences, in deep sleep we seem to be finding the exact opposite of that. And that's also um, 
confirmed by our findings in terms of criticality. So we also find uh, the exact opposite effect in terms of critical <coughs> signatures. So we find that these, uh, the effects of criticality or the signatures of criticality rather diminish in, in deep sleep. So, um, to kind of summarize overall what, what the, this whole set of studies indicate is that there seem to be certain characteristic signatures that one can find or we can find in terms of connectome harmonics in different, in different brain states, uh, such as the psychedelic state induced by LSD or psilocybin, and meditation, mindfulness meditation that we have looked so far as well as sleep state. Um, and I would like to close with this, with this perspective uh, of Nikola Tesla, where he said, if you want to understand the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration, and maybe if we follow this perspective and apply it to extract signatures of different state that may give us uh, better clues about understanding the brain. So i leave you with that. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay, so did, did you manage to go online and post the thing? Is it working? Is it not working? Like for someone? Like definitely not working? Okay, so yeah, we have one question from this online thing from Marianna. So thank you, Marianna. Did your research account for personality traits? And if so, do your findings in any way show correlations between LSD effects and personality traits? I think it's a great question. Uh, we haven't looked at different personality traits yet, but we did discuss it in, in some of our work in terms of future research. I think it would be very, very interesting to, uh, to if, we, if we manage to get the data in terms of the brain activity of different personality traits and uh, decomposing uh, those data sets into the harmonics and see if there are significant differences between different personality traits, that would be really exciting to look at. Uh, the same thing also applies for psychiatric disorders, which is uh, what we are planning to do next. Okay, now there are some other questions coming. Uh, what was the dosage of LSD in the discussed studies? Oh, that's great. Well, uh, we didn't collect the data ourselves, so I need to go back to the, I think, 75, or maybe Chris knows better. Uh, 75 micrograms. Yeah, 75, right? Oh, actually, yeah, we, I forgot to uh, mention our colleagues and collaborators who contributed to the study. So let me thank to all of these people who actually made the, this whole journey and the work happen. Uh, Morten Kringlebach, Gustavo Deco, and also Anira who collected the meditation data set, and our collaborators from Imperial College London, uh, Robin Carhart Terrace, uh, Leo Roseman, and Mendel Kalen, who kind, very, very generously shared their uh, LSD and psilocybin data sets with us, and Joel Pearson and Isaac Donnelly, with whom I started developing the Connectome Harmonic Framework together. And yeah, so also thank you all. Okay, so there's another question. Uh, do high frequency harmonics also correlate with higher level functions? i.e. metacognition, conceptual thinking. So do high frequency harmonics also correlate with higher level cognitive functions, for example, metacognition or conceptual thinking? Well, we have to look for that. I mean, um, but I'm not, I, I don't know. So intuitive, I can un only answer intuitively based on my experience with analysis so far. So knowing that the resting state networks, uh, which also uh, have a link to, to functional networks of the human brain, mostly match the low frequencies. So it would be the first 200 which are suppressed um, are in that. But the fact that the whole repertoire is, is enhanced or increasing, opening up more possibilities, it would be very hard to predict what would be the final without looking at the data. So maybe we would have to look at that. I think there's a question from the audience yeah. as well. Sorry, my, my tablet is in the back. So it's okay. Just a 
quick question. In terms of signatures, what were you, um, did you ever think of uh, using uh, integrated information theory? No. Because you, you mentioned Tesla's one, two, three, but how about information, which is mm -hmm. a much more, um, say, universal uh, parameter for looking at complexity? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. Um I think there is, we, we, we do discuss that as uh, in, in most of the conferences with other colleagues as well. So out of all of these discussions, it became very clear that uh, integrated information theory and complexity would actually also uh, agree in a way what, with our findings or our findings would agree with their predictions, which is the increase in complexity with, uh, with consciousness or loss of complexity with the loss of consciousness is exactly what you would find because in loss of consciousness if you recall from the computational model uh, is accompanied by a narrowing down of the repertoire which would exactly mean loss of complexity so your repertoire is actually shrinking and it is um, losing the high frequencies which actually show more complex patterns so if you remember the reconstruction of the movie up so the high frequency, the more frequencies we, we add, the more complex the whole signal becomes. So it actually ag totally agrees with that. Um, so I wanted to ask, um, in the resting state uh, data, you should have mainly lower frequencies as fMRI is slow. Like what the frequencies are that you're focusing on. And if you would expect the same thing to see it in the MEG data sets. Mm -hmm. So uh, also like this increase. And if there's some way um, to boil this down to like local specific um, regions driving the oscillation like thalamus or pecunius or so uh, in this approach or if you are stuck to like such a global measure of all over the brain there's this uh, power analysis. So I'll start with the first one. Um, the advantage of this type of spatial decomposition, so we are using the advantage of high spatial resolution of fMRI and in the decomposition we take each time frame and decompose it into the set of harmonics so we are not bounded by the temporal resolution of the fMRI which um, is kind of an advantage uh, of, the, of the method that we can use uh, hence we, we are not decomposing temporal frequencies does that make any sense? we are decomposing spatial patterns so it's not really, uh, it is in a way Fourier transform expanded to the spatial domain by constraint by the anatomy of the human brain. Uh, but having said that, we wouldn't know uh, at this stage of the analysis at least um, exactly to what temporal frequencies it corresponds. Because if, if this hypothesis is true, then low spatial frequencies would correspond to low temporal frequencies as well. But we wouldn't know exactly what hertz we are talking about. And coming to your second question, I think we may be able to figure that out from the MEG data, which we also hope to do in the near future. Because if we decompose MEG data in, in spatial uh, domain using this approach, and in temporal domain, for instance, using um, Fourier transform, and if we uh, align the peaks, that can give us some clues, which we are hoping to do in the near future, but not yet. And what was your last question again? Sorry, uh, certain area, certain local regions driving it. So in this um, study, the connectome harmonics were computed on the thalamocortical system. So we included the thalamus, but nothing else uh, other than the cortex. Um, one possibility would be extending it to the subcortical structures as well. But uh, I'm not sure if that can tell us which structure de derives it. Uh, I think in order to test that, one should, uh, one could go to computational modeling and test it uh, using this type of connectivity and the Laplace. But yeah, if you have any ideas, uh, happy to discuss further too. Yeah. So thank you for your inspiring uh, presentation. Um, when well, you showed the patterns <coughs> at first, the, 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 the frequencies of sound. It uh, reminds me of the, the visual hallucinations uh, you can experience uh, during um, uh, the use of psychedelics. Do you think that there's any connection? Um, how, how would you explain that? Yeah, thank, thank you for this question because I mean I, I packed so much information to the slides I, I left it out but uh, the very same model that we that we extended to the whole cortex and that we are now also working together with Marco that uh, has been used in the literature very uh, 
quite a lot uh, to explain the visual hallucinations. And if you restrict the, the same equations only to visual cortex, and if you take into account the, the biological mapping that we have from the retina to the visual cortex, you can predict the six different visual hallucinations which are categorized as the basic visual hallucinations in, in the hallucinatory state. And they also, uh, in a way, they correspond to one or two harmonics, but including the mapping um, from, the, from the retina to the, to the visual cortex. So uh, it really nicely links to that um, in terms of using the same mathematics to describe both phenomena. In one case, it is restricted to the visual cortex, and in the other one, we are looking at the whole brain. Uh, uh, what do you hypothesize as the base? So at the beginning of your talk, you showed this slide from uh, one of Bujaki's reviews of the, the different uh, frequencies of LFPs that can be observed in the brain. And what do you think is the uh, basis of the connectome harmonics in uh, the electrical activity of the brain? Um, so the hypothesis is really, and that's why we did the computational modeling study and what, why we are following up on that. Uh, the hypothesis is that the interplay between excitation and inhibition gives rise to the self-organization of oscillatory patterns. And that's not our hypothesis actually, that's a, there's a, a giant literature on, on that idea. But what we showed is that the, the building blocks of those spatiotemporal patterns actually uh, are these harmonic waves, or they can be estimated as a combination of, of these harmonic patterns. So the self-organization of the spatiotemporal patterns is due to uh, the dynamics of excitatory and inhibitory activity. Um, so to follow up on that, um, so I'm a neuroscientist, I work on circuits, so I'm aware of this literature of how the interplay with excitation and inhibition generates uh, electrical oscillations mm -hmm. in, in the brain. Um, but I'm still not clear on like the chicken and egg of like, you know, what, of, between the connective harmonics and, and electrical oscillations or spiking or other, other electrical activity. Or... So I think going to spiking would be a, a jump on the scale of course but um, so in when we take the computational model which describes the space and time or spatial temporal dynamics of the brain uh, if we decompose it into the evolution of different harmonics we do find by restricting the parameter space into a certain range we find a change in the possibility of the connectome harmonics so in that sense since the hypothesis would be it is the very same uh, models that people use can um, actually activate or deactivate certain harmonic patterns. And if you think of the link between connectome harmonics and the, the Fourier, it's actually what we are suggesting is a, nothing other than a change of representation, to be honest. They only say, instead of looking at space and time, let's lo look at frequencies uh, over space and time. So. It would be the very same mechanism that creates oscillations would be creating the, these spatial patterns as well. Uh, so you're basically just getting a different readout of the same underlying exactly. process. Okay, thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for a uh, fantastic talk. Okay. Uh, very beautifully explained. Uh, I have a basic question, just a curiosity, if you've looked at conventional fMRI uh, functional connectivity analysis um, in relationship to the subjective data and seeing if this performs better in terms of correlation or uh, yeah the link to subjective experience uh, if, if you find added value in the in the harmonics I think it's a good point um, we haven't looked at the functional connectivity relationship to subjective experience, but I think that is reported in, in many publications. So it's a good point. We can go back to the literature, see, um, at, see the functional connectivity link to subjective experience, um, and also studies done on the same data set that may reveal um, whether there is value in, in looking at this type of uh, perspective versus the normal functional connectivity. 
I think I see the value in, uh, in including this type of analysis uh, into the whole domain of, of studies is that it kind of gives this link, not only the FC, not only the functional connectivity, but it seems to uh, provide an understanding of the link between temporal, spatial, as well as the dynamics constrained by the anatomy and so on. So if it, even if it agrees with the reported FC correlations, uh, I think it would be, uh, I, I see the value of, of the advantage of this method as kind of trying to bring the pieces of the puzzle together for our understanding to ask further questions. Of course, I, just to follow, I, I, yeah. Yeah, I was also thinking of the possibility of complementing the other sort yeah, of Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, I think yeah. your point is very well taken. So. And the other question is uh, the intriguing difference in the, in the lower frequencies uh, that is uh, lacking in the meditative state compared to the psychedelic state. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you have any sort of like uh, intuition regarding why the difference is mm -hmm. in terms of subjective experience or, or yeah. the different state? You know, mm -hmm. what, what that tells you about the difference between states? Yeah. Well, thanks for this question too. I mean, I can give my interpretation of it. Um, if that's correct or not needs to be tested, of course. But um, the increase of high frequencies happening in both cases suggest that uh, in both cases there is an enhanced awareness or enhanced repertoire of experiences. And the fact that the low frequencies are suppressed in the psychedelic but not in the meditative state, and also if we take into account that the resting state networks are mostly matching the low frequencies, it in a way feels like um, maybe our relationship to our daily conscious awake state is suppressed in the psychedelic state to some degree. Whereas it remains the same in the meditation, but meditation seems to be broadening the high frequencies, uh, like the psychedelic state. So, I mean, it's very speculative what I'm saying, but it could be that um, that indicates the change of the conscious uh, resting state activity, our daily awake consciousness kind of being uh, suppressed or lost or changed in the psychedelic state, which seems to be more preserved in the meditative state. Thank you. So, um, just to go back to the the, the person who um, was asking about the link between um, entropy, criticality, and and Tunani's complexity. So the question is the following: It seems to me that depending on the measure that you use. Um, there are two notions that maybe are orthogonal to each other. So one is how large your repertoire is, okay, so the different states that it can occupy, and the other one, so this is more the, if you like, spatial aspect, dimension. And then you have a temporal dimension, which is once you are in this state, how, how, how likely is it that it will occupy another state? But it seems to me, so what all these studies are showing us is that of course, most of the time, you know, if you have a large repertoire, then it will be more difficult to anticipate what the next state will be. But we can, I think, imagine a case in which the two are dissociated, that is. So what's your view on this? Yeah. In which case, we, we would not have a bi-dimensional model, but four different cases, right? Different types of states and not two. Mm -hmm. So if I understand correctly, you're saying the, post the, the fact that the repertoire is broader doesn't mean that your brain activity will be exploring that repertoire. Exactly. So you can have a very broad repertoire and yet don't switch very quickly from one state to another. Mm -hmm. In which case there is no high entropy or no you know, criticality if, yeah, so, um, if, that, if it's very stable and yet there is a yeah, large repertoire. Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I think I get the idea. Um, so, in terms of the model, that's absolutely right, but in the fMRI data, because we are decomposing the data, the fact that we find an, an enhanced repertoire or a larger repertoire is actually coming from the data. So, that means that there are more states explored. But uh, in terms of switching, you're right, so we haven't looked at the switching rate be between different states. So, if you think of uh, the brain states creating a landscape, we can say with these findings that under LSD or in the psychedelic state, your brain is exploring a broader landscape or um, 
like yes, it's exploring a broader landscape. So that's um, in that sense that links also to the complexity. But in terms of switching rates, uh, one has to look at the probabilities of going from one state to another, and and we are really thinking about how to do it best as next. Um, we did find with, uh, with our colleagues who looked at the psilocybin data sets, they did find changes in the switching uh, between different states, but not using this type of method, using a different type of method. So I would just say overall, the fact that we find enhanced repertoire coming from fMRI data suggests that there's a, there's a more uh, states are explored. In terms of the switching, um, one has to look at the frequency of, of the switching. But the hypothesis would be, for instance, in uh, disorders such as depression, one would have um, a lower switching rate or a state that's really dominating it. And it was nice because um, that we, found, we had a panel discussion two days ago uh, where one of the subjects who participated at the psychedelic study uh, actually also um, expressed his view on, on depression, on, on, on his experience and saying um, that a de depression would be really comparable to playing one musical note over and over again. So following on that phenomenological perspective as well, uh, I would hypothesize that uh, it would also increase the switching rate or possibility of exploration. Um, but that we find in, in the expansion of the repertoire, so it's very likely. But we will have to look at the switching rates too, in order to conclude it fully. Great talk, by the way. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering if you followed up on your subjects, like say six months after the initial scans, to see how the resting state changes over time. Mm -hmm. Like say six months after a psilocybin or an LSD experience, do you also see these changes in frequencies and the enhancement of the repertoire? Mm -hmm. Does it last? Great question too. Um, for these subjects, there wasn't any follow-up, but um, I haven't shown any results from the psilocybin depression study, which we just recently started analyzing. And for that, I believe there was a follow-up after three months. Um, I think it would be too early to, to make any conclusion uh, yet. Uh, I can only say that the, the changes wouldn't be as strong as during the trip, of course. We wouldn't find such a giant increase in energy or power or high frequencies. But uh, we do suspect there are long-term changes, and uh, but I, it's too early to probably make any conclusion on that. We, yeah. yeah, I'm looking forward to the follow-up, because that is the most significant of course, think, outcome yeah. of yeah, I mean, like there seems to be differences in, in that follow-up, but that's also with depression patients um, and the long-term effect of psychedelics in the depressed brain, so to speak. Um, but the, the results uh, so far indicate that it's not like the, uh, the case, the differences between placebo and LSD. It's not like a giant uh, increase in that, and it's, it's not as enhanced as during the trip. But there seem to be other other differences which we are investigating right now. Thank you.